Hello, welcome to Sketching with Izzy. Got to do a quick sound check, video check, make sure everything's working. Uh, if you guys can hear me, absolutely let me know. If you could. Anywho, welcome. Today we're starting something new. We're going to start a new painting. Actually, we're going to be doing some sketching and some exploration today. I'm thinking I'm going to do some character exploration. Um, in the past uh, week or so, I've been talking about starting a new project here on Twitch. So I think that we're going to go ahead and get it going tonight. So welcome to the inaugural day in which we test out uh, this new IP that I want to develop. What's up, Irma Gerd? Uh, can you hear me all right? And check my mic. Looks like my mic input is working, but I can't see if it's working on the side. Okay, great, awesome, awesome. All right, so essentially uh, what we're gonna be doing is a little bit of main character exploration today. For the main character of this IP I'm looking to develop, I would like to uh, do an illustrated novel type thing. Think kind of Tales from the Loop, Simon Stallenhog. And uh, we're starting it tonight together. So I'm, I'm super excited to start sharing uh, the process for everything. This is going to be, uh, I, I guess this requires just a little bit of backstory. So settle in, let's have a little bit of a chat. Essentially this, this concept finds its root from way back when I was working at Sony. We had just finished uh, God of War Ascension. So the game that came out before the uh, God of War that takes place in Norse mythology. And we were invited to kind of come up with some different ideas. And I, and I developed an idea and was getting set to pitch it, but I never really did get to pitch it because when, when I explained it to a friend of mine who was my, uh, one of my co-concept uh, art guys there, uh, they kind of like, eh, this might be a little bit too much for God of War. So there's a primer for you on this bad boy. Uh, essentially, the basis for this story is it was meant to be kind of a reboot, it, the, a going back to the beginning. I wanted to take the idea of God of War and take it outside of what Sony had established. So I think this is pretty much fair game. I wanted to do an, a new origin story for another God of War. And uh, it's really tied, it, it gave me an opportunity to kind of explore some of the cultures, histories, and mythologies that I'm super interested in, and I feel like are not explored enough in storytelling, uh, especially their, their, their systems of storytelling. So uh, without uh, further ado, the story title that I've got, it's sort of a working title, is Blood Flower. It's a story about a young girl who is taken as an orphan, is taken in by a group of nuns in sort of a proto-Mayan, proto-Aztecan, Mesoamerican myth culture. So there's, I'm layering a whole lot of uh, what I know about the ancient religions and the, the extant religions for the Maya and the Aztecs. I'm taking what I've learned about, you know, the Popolva, I'm using elements of Aztec history and things like that in order to create a new creation myth. So it's whole cloth. Um, it's meant to be a an inspired by. It's as Aztec, it's as Mayan as Conan is, you know, uh, Mesopotamian or whatever inspired that, right? So it's meant to be a new myth. And essentially my model for this new myth is, so it's a God of War concept in that it's just, it's ultra violent, but I wanted to create a story that was basically a retelling of the Immaculate Conception, but as through, as though it was this proto Mesoamerican culture. So Bloodflower is gonna be the story of this girl who joins a nunnery as a kid and experiences Immaculate Conception, which shouldn't happen, obviously. And the nuns will take it in a very different way than, well, I guess maybe even in the way that the Bible takes it, where this is a bit weird. And so the chaos and madness that, that will carry on throughout will be the, the result of these sort of seeds I'm planting as the goalposts, the starting point 
for our story. So I've left it really, really open because what I wanna do is I wanna explore this concept and develop this alongside you guys so that you're part of this. I thought it would be really interesting for you to see the whole process from beginning to end and take part and have some input in this, which would be fun, right? Uh, so what I've done is I've used the Save the Cat model, which is uh, basically story beats that are established for your standard sort of popcorn style uh, hero's journey, but it could be really any variation there end of the hero's journey. And there are different points. And what we'll be doing is I've broken it up according to Tales from the Loop, where it's going to be like a 200, 200 plus page book half of which will be, uh, I'm sorry, not 200, it'll be 150 or so page book, half of which will be artwork and the other half will be written word. So that's kind of the idea that I've got going on. And as I was saying in the beginning, today we're just gonna be doing a little bit of character exploration and getting ourselves comfortable with this theme and the world. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started. I've, I've been collecting reference. This was an idea that I came up with again years ago and it's kind of been just sitting in the back burner. It's something I always wanted to tackle, and I feel like now's a great time to do that. And Twitch is the perfect format for sharing this idea and kind of like developing it on the spot. So I'm very nervous, <laughs> forgive me on that. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to pitch something that doesn't exist. It's hard to get people excited about something that doesn't exist. And it's especially difficult to sell something that is so generally alien. I'm pretty well, uh, I mean, for a, a total novice, I'm pretty well learned for some of this history that we're talking about and the myth that we're talking about, and I'm just an absolute nerd about myth. So we're gonna be mixing it up and we're doing something different. Again, this is, this is a new story. I'm super not looking to offend anyone with this thing. It'll happen anyway, this always happens with art, but it's a new story with new ideas. So here we have some reference for the main character whose name will translate to Bloodflower. Her name, let's pull up my uh, Scrivener file. So you can see it. So this is, this is the best way to start an art program is to just open it up with a giant block of text. But I'm also a writer and not everybody knows that about me. So here we go. All right, so this is the, uh, the Bloodflower breakdown. It's not even finished. It's not in its entirety. Like I said, this is going to be a shared experience together. But what I've done is I've broken up the, difference, the, the different um, beats, the story beats from Saved by the Cat, or <laughs> Save, the, Save the Cat. Uh, I forgot the name of the damn book just now. Anyway, whatever. Uh, from the book, I use the story beats and I've divided up the story beats in order to have little vignettes in which we can plant an illustration. So there should be four to five illustrations per story beat. And as I develop the art, we're gonna, I'm gonna write the story in the back end because you guys don't wanna watch me actually writing text. But uh, that'll, that's my plan so far. So the main character's name is Alatli Tlala. And this is, a, this is a pretty cool diphthong right here. It's actually my favorite sound in the whole world. It comes from uh, the, the Nawa people wore the... Uh... Hi, Lisbeth, Lisbeth, Lisbeth. Welcome. Uh, it's, it's a diphthong that comes from the language Nahuatl, which is the language of the Nahua people, which are one of the many tribes that made up the Aztec Empire. And the Nahua are still extant today. There are still lots of people out there. Uh, and they still speak the language. In fact, a lot of the um, really interesting words that you hear in, in uh, Mexico have some of these sounds in them. For example, the town where my boat is still living is Mazatlan. Mazatlan uses this diphthong. Mazatlan means deer or a uh, place of the deer in uh, Nahuatl. So it's my favorite sound my, and, and I had to get my main character to have this in there many times. So Alatli Tlala is the name of our main character. She's a young uh, female. Um, she's an orphan, of course, because all these stories start with orphans, right? And uh, she's meant to be kind of a badass. And a after the Immaculate Conception uh, scenes happen, you know, sort of later on in the story, our... Uh, thanks for the follow, Lisbeth. 
uh, what's going to happen is we're going to take it down the extreme of the mythos and the religions of the Aztecs and the proto-Mayans. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a very different take on that Immaculate Conception idea. Sorry guys for the shine. It is quite warm where I'm at. I think it's 100 degrees today. Whew. All I got is the fans going. Hopefully they're not too loud for you. Anyway, so let's take a look at our reference. I've told you before, when I'm looking at reference for uh, uh, characters and things like that, I'm after uh, different looking things. I'm not necessarily looking to answer the, the design. I'm looking for inspiration for the design. Yes, the speculars. I got those for days. I used to, This is a little known fact for my, my friends and, and fans that know of my art, is that I actually started out as a musician. And I played the saxophone, the sexy saxophone. Uh, long, long ago, and my biggest, the thing I hated the most about it was the damn lights, because the lights, uh, they're so hot. Yeah, the sexophone, sexomophone. So it was too hot, makes me sweaty. I get all shiny, and I hate it. That's not why I left music, but it was definitely a contributing factor to why I did not particularly enjoy it. I love music, hated performing just because of the heat of the lights. So, let me know. I'm sure, I'm sure Ermagerd will let me know. Thanks. All right, so here we are. We're looking at, uh, I looked up reference for Mayan and Aztec costume. Now, here's the problem is, a lot of what we know about the costume is based off of, <laughs> I did bring it up, but I had to, you know, come on. So uh, a lot of the, the problem with a lot of costume is that it's all we really know of a lot of these costumes is based on stonework. And the stonework doesn't really well communicate. Let me fast forward through this song. That didn't work. Take a second. No. Go away. So uh, the stonework means that our idea of the costumes are pretty limited and they're going to be pretty simplified. And I think, of course, everybody kind of takes their own, um, they do their own spin on it. So we're going to do our own spin on it, influenced by architecture, influenced by sort of accepted visuals for this historical culture. And again, we are, we are not aiming to do a historical piece. This is totally ahistorical. We are creating a new God creation myth. So we'll be touching on moments we'll be getting rhythms that are inspired by things like the popova which you should totally read it's weird as hell and awesome um but it's never it's nothing i'm doing is meant to be a direct take or a direct build on these these cultures or these histories it's it's a new mythology so what i like let's let's go over what i like about these these different uh uh photo references and so I can show you uh, kind of my thinking when it comes to character design, because we've talked a lot about painting so far, but in reality, illustration is only a very small part of what I do. I'm actually primarily a character concept artist uh, and creatures as well. So that's like my, 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 what's the word? My specialty, I guess you'd say, is character creature design. And then all of that is built on the back of a solid understanding of how painting, you know, light and form works. But what I teach is light and form because light, uh, you know, the, the logic of light and color is a formula that I can give you. That's, you know, this plus this equals this. These are hard and fast rules up to a point. When we're talking about design, it's kind of a whole other beast. There's a lot of rules, but they're totally open for uh, sort of arbitrary changes and depending on how you feel or what your style is and all sorts of things. So I tend to veer away from sort of the squishier, arbitrary, subjective stuff and I like to keep it pretty firm and objective when I'm teaching. But that said, we're not teaching. This is Twitch, we're gonna be having some fun. So I'm gonna be doing what I like to do and you have to follow. Take that. All right, so the things I like. Something that you're going to see a lot in uh, in Mayan art in particular are these kinds of shapes where these gourds and things like that uh, of the hats, uh, headdresses, there's, there's, there are a lot of really common themes that follow a, 
a, a very specific kind of uh, abstraction of nature. So a lot of that art is an abs a lot of the art that you see and a lot of the costume that you see is abstractions of nature, specifically animals, but almost uh, most importantly plants, and in particular one plant. Anybody got want to take a guess of the most important plant in Mesoamerica? Ah, I'll give it to you. It's corn, right? That's basically where it comes from. So corn is a huge part in the history there. Uh, in fact, if you read the myth, there are there's multiple um, points throughout their ages. They basically have ages of history in which people tried to people. And uh, you had a different, the, the gods tried to make people multiple times. And uh, corn was one of the objects, like mud, mud and, and bone are, are construction pieces in sort of the Judaic uh, tradition. Mud and corn is the uh, Mesoamerican version. So you're gonna see a lot, of, a lot of symbolism that if you actually think about it in the abstract is meant to evoke corn, it's an interesting concept. So things like husks, the tendrils, we're gonna be picking up on some of these and try and bring them into our character design. Um, so that's the thing that I liked about a lot of these, in particular, like this headdress, it feel like it has these little moments, these little design elements that are evocative of the, of the important creatures, particularly birds and also corn, gourds, super important. I love the, the face paints that we see in these. I think there's some really great motifs from Meso Mesoamerican tradition. So we're gonna be pulling from all of this stuff. The key will be to not overdo it, to, to pull from it enough that we're getting, uh, that it is evocative. Again, I, I'm overusing the word, but it's absolutely apropos right here. If it's evocative of these of these cultures, evocative of these myths, without hitting you over the head with it, which I think is what happens with some of the costume design in in like dance tradition and things like that, is they go they take everything and put it all on. What we want to do is take everything but make it feel lived in and make it feel real. This is what makes really successful design for like film concept art and video game concept art is the fantastical, the over the top, but just enough that it's iconic rather than uh, overboard, if that makes sense. And it's a fine line, it's a really fine line. And we're gonna tip back and forth over that, I guarantee you, as we explore. Um, things I really like also are facial structure. We we're talking about um, actual anatomical differences in terms of skull. Uh, that I really want to capture. That's going to be super important with this. Is that I capture the feel of these of the people that are inspiring this story. So the Mayan and the Aztecs in particular. So I'm looking at uh, orbital bone structure. I'm looking at brow. I'm looking at the nose shape, how the bridge forms, the muzzle, uh, and those are all common features with some of these. I actually have all folders of inspiration for Bloodflower. This story. Um, but because we're only doing, we're only tackling one thing today, that's what we're going to focus on. And, and I'll pull out more and more reference as we continue to explore. And when we finally get to illustrations, then we'll really start digging into it. Um, let's see, what else? I'm sure you're all uh, kind of curious about this, this image right here, which has no elements whatsoever of uh, Aztec or Mayan or anything like that. And this goes back to how I search for reference. I don't look for reference that answers the question directly. I look for things that inspire ideas in me. And I really like the way the face is pinched in this, the headpiece. I like uh, elements of that costume in terms of how kind of outlandish it is. Again, we're not making a historical fiction piece here. We're making a new myth. So I wanna borrow from a lot of different areas and, and be inspired. I really like uh, these beads down here on the lower right. Again, um, I'm thinking evocative of corn. I'm thinking about, so the, the patterns of corn that we're gonna see, I wanna use elements like that that are going to back up this visual motif that I'm establishing early. I'm making a decision early on that this is a motif that I want to maintain and it will help inform my design as I go. Um, I love, love the, uh, the face paint design here and here. 
in particular, how it carves up the face. It changes the shape of the face in different ways, and that's what I'm after, okay? I want to use the, the makeup and the tattoos to make the face iconic and unique so that when people see artwork that's for blood flower, there will be no question that this is artwork by me or about this story. Make sense? Um, what else I want to get into? Oh, of course. So feathers are a huge part of, in particular, the Aztec tradition for dancers and for costuming. The warriors would wear these massive uh, capes covered in hummingbird, hummingbird feathers. Can you imagine a cape made with hummingbird feathers? You know how big hummingbirds are? How do you catch a hummingbird, right? I think that's incredible. Um, but that, that would be like a, a cape completely uh, threaded with hummingbird feathers would be something that a king would wear like it's because it's so valuable it's so hard to get and the color is so beautiful and shimmery like scarab beetles or something like that so we've got all of these different influences that we can pull from but this is kind of the this is kind of the design catch that i'm after here so i've got all of these different elements that i want to pull from but i wanted to design these nuns so this kind of requires an explanation of this nun religion so I'm basing this religion on kind of the Aztec tradition a little bit more than the Mayan one. The Aztecs, the, I guess the Mayans in, in uh, post-classical didn't have anything really more uh, along the lines of blood sacrifices and things like that. It's an older, older tradition. But I do want these nuns to basically practice this form of blood magic. And it's going to be really intrinsic, intrinsic to the story as we get deeper into it. So I'm excited to get into that. But so there has to be this, this kind of um dark fantasy element that i want to throw on top of everything else so it's going to be like the the sprinklings on top so anyway hopefully uh that makes sense and, and my my thought process is, you're able to follow it and and we're we're all on the same page if you have questions lean in at any time but i'm just going to get started drawing how's that sound finally shut up i've been talking for a half an hour jesus so I'm not looking at a reference for um, lighting or figure. Right now, I just want to do some kind of explorations with, uh, with the shapes, motifs. I'm, what I'm doing is kind of like warming up. I'm just trying to familiarize myself with this world. And by doing that, I kind of need to explore it. And to visually explore it, I got to get in there. I just got to start making stuff. Dan Rob, welcome. You did show up at just the right time. You missed the, the, the big explanation of what we're going to be doing for the next year or so. But uh, I'm sure you'll pick it up. All right. Because the, the original inspiration for this was God of War and, the Sony's, and Sony's franchise, I definitely want to capture that kind of like Simon Bisley, uh, Frazetta style, over the topness as a fantasy. And that's going to be a major contributing factor to this. So this will be an extremely violent, hyper, uh, over the top type of story. Blood is going to be a big part of this thing. And a lot of that ties back to the religions that I'm using as kind of a starting point for the religion that we have in the story um and a lot of that i mean so, there is some explanation required for that because so many of us are really well versed in the modern religions like buddhism or christianity or um islam things like that there there's very there's a lot of information about those things that exists right now yeah, I can't wait for this to unfold either. And I'm, I'm so excited to be doing it with y'all. It's gonna be great. Um, so part of understanding their religion is gonna require understanding a bit of the history there. And part of the, part of the history, or rather not, not literal history, but the mythological history of Mesoamerica is many of the religions believe that, or ha they, they were built on the concept that the peoples that exist, the, you know, the, the present age, were people that were like the third or fourth try that the gods made an effort to make. And so the gods had 
tried, you know, making people out of wood. They tried making people out of pumpkins. They tried, they, you really got to read these stories. They're so great. But they've, they tried making the peoples out of all of these different materials. And is some of the people would not grow arms or they would not learn to walk. Uh, one of the peoples that they made would never procreate. They, did, they were not interested in procreation and just died off. So the gods were really stumped and they were trying to find a way in order to make these people uh, that were in their image, that, that had the, the interests and the drive and the abilities that the gods had themselves. They wanted to make something in their image. And so in the end, the gods sacrificed themselves in order to create the world, in order to create man. And in so doing, like, you know, it's, it, it, this is very similar to Greek myth in that, you know, their literal body parts, their tears, their blood, their ejaculate and all manner of things ended up becoming the mountains, the earth, the sea, the sky, the stars, etc., etc. But one of the biggest sacrifices that the gods made was in their blood. And by sacrificing blood, it was like the, it's the most sacred thing. So in these, in these ancient religions, we don't think of it this way, but sacrifice and blood are ultra holy. In fact, uh, with some of the Aztec religion, uh, the only way to get into their equivalent of what we would call heaven, I guess, would be, or, or get into the afterlife properly, would be to die in battle or to die as sacrifice. That's how important this is in their, in their world. So things like blood and, and the showering of blood have a completely different meaning for these ancient peoples than how we think about it. It's not, it's not a horror. It's, it, I mean, of course, dying is scary, but it meant, it meant something different. So we have to think about it in regard to that uh, historical and religious context. That's something completely different. So you would have things like uh, sayings like uh, the, that the fall of blood is like flowers. And if you look at uh, what's interesting is if you look at modern uh, Mexican takes on Catholicism, there's a lot of interesting stuff that pulls from these ancient uh, religions and, and mythologies, and it still exists. I mean, Day of the Dead is a perfect example, right? The, the, the whole concept that you die two deaths, you die the death, uh, your original death, and then you die another death when the last person who remembers you is gone. And uh, so Shababa, the, 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 the underworld, is a place of, of many different... Uh, of many different levels and those levels are dependent on you know whether or not you're remembered what what sort of service you provided in life i think that's kind of an interesting perspective eh we're just pooping out shapes um I'm not even sure. See, I mean, at this stage, we're, we are straight up starting the first sketch for this whole concept. I don't even know what style I want to do this in. If I want this to be realistic or a little bit cartoony or, or more graphic. Graphic would make sense because it's in keeping with the artistic style of my influences here. But that's not really what I paint. So I'm kind of inspired to go in, in, in my direction and just do my take on this. Transform this all. Yeah, it is. It is an interesting take on on death. I, I found it's one of those things that I learned living in Mexico. I really got to got familiar with the um, the rituals of the Day of the Dead and 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 the Day of the Children, which is before the Day of the Dead, and. Or the day of the little angels. That's that's another way of saying it. And it's amazing how they, how a lot of families, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? How they honor. It's it's not ancestor worship. It is an honoring of their dead. It, it's a remembering 
and that and a purposeful remembering designed to keep the dead alive which is super beautiful um i loved it and their celebrations were incredible i mean um i <laughs> it's so funny i didn't even really understand what i was seeing living there until i watched uh coco have you guys seen that the pixar movie so great Straight up tears. Tough one. Beautiful movie. And I love I love stories like that where the they take they take a concept that is it's so well known to that culture and then kind of share it with us. And it's like we should all feel really honored to get stories like that. Anytime that happens, it's so great. I love to see cultural stories from other places. So we don't even realize it, but our our storytelling and our myth in Western society, when I say that, I mean Eurocentric Western society is so heavily influenced by one set of mythologies that uh, it's kind of it's kind of crazy. All of our stories start in this one place. I mean, we definitely have a, a pretty heavy dose of Norse mythology and the Northman mythology thrown in, but almost everything finds its root in Roman and Greek. And a lot of our stories are, are kind of come from that place or build on that, that deep cultural, almost genetic understanding, right? Um, so that's why I was so fascinated when I've done things like read the Popolva or... Um, I'm completely spacing the name, the Indian cre creation myth, the Hindu creation myth. It's beautiful stories. Um, when I discovered these, it totally changed my perspective on, on how I've been understanding story and how I think about story because we expect, that's even, even things like Save the Cat, right? Are so dependent on this specific kind of storytelling, this specific kind of thinking, you know, it that they don't take into account um, the different the different ways that stories can be told, and the different ways that a pay a, a setup can be made, and then the payoff can be followed through. It's totally different. I I have found, you know, through my years of reading and studying the different myths in the world that the ones that really grab me are the ones that come up with non-traditional reasons for things. I always like that. Like, this is why the moon is shaped the way it is. This is why the prince, uh, th this is why the cactus looks the way it looks. I love those stories. Of course, I'm doing my twig thing again. Um, one of the things that I've read about with the with some of the darker Aztec uh, religious orders were things like uh, th there were priests that would never bathe and would daily um, uh, douse themselves in, in blood and things like that. And so they would have this terrible smell or be covered with flies and I mean, these, this is not everyone, of course. This is, these are just specific cults within specific religions. So you, can, you cannot generalize. But the extremes that some of these groups went to and the, the belief system, the process that they... Because there is a logical... There's a logical path that took them from, you know, uh, these are the stories of my ancestors, these are the stories of my gods. And this is why I wear the skin of another human being. You see? Because it's so alien, we often we often don't think about that stuff. Uh, or or even it's it's impossible to approach it. Um, but I don't know. I find. I find some kind of weird storytelling solace in, in the strangeness of it. The, 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 the joy in sympathizing with something that's beyond sympathy by modern standards.
So one of the things that's going to happen during the process of this story is that Alatli will become pregnant. And uh, as she does, uh, her body's going to change, and it's going to change really fast because she's been impregnated by a god. Um, I want to be able to show that in the story, and I want to be able to show, show this, this natural and, and different form of dress. But I also have to keep in mind that we're on Twitch, right? So boobies are a no-no, uh, I suppose, as, as we progress on our Twitch thing, even though I've done boobies in the past. So I'm going to cover them up with this corn maze style pattern of beads. But I also needed, I need to be able to show her belly as it grows during the story. And that's going to be a really important part of this. So I'm thinking about how to design this costume in a way. And again, this is just an initial sketch that we'll be able to show that. I might have said this, but is my story going to be based heavily on real historical ones or more made up? This story is 100% made up. It is heavily influenced by uh, Mesoamerican myth and Mesoamerican history, but is 100% made up. It is not intended to be uh, uh, based on anything in reality. I'm just using all of these as a jumping off point. So I'm basically taking Mesoamerican mythology and history, and I'm taking the, uh, the myth of the Immaculate Conception and putting the, the two of them together and making something new out of it. So this girl is young, but as she grows in belly, she also grows in power. She's already a powerful blood mage, if you will, which is what her, her sorority of nuns specialize in, is, is a kind of blood magic. So she's already quite powerful with this, but by, by being impregnated by this god and carrying a demigod, her power will grow throughout the story. And, of course, the violence will also grow, and I'm super excited to share that kind of stuff. So we're going to have to explore all of that. It's going to be great. Let's get us started on a new sketch. Nothing is... Uh, we're not marrying ourselves to anything right now. Right now it's just... Um, exploration stage. This is also kind of like a slight middle finger to, uh, you know, previous folks that have had opinions on stories that said things like, you know, I, I even heard it with this specific story when I pitched it to someone that uh, pregnant women can't fight and shit like that. And I want to, I just want to make something that says, do what I want. It's fantasy. I got the same thing with Granny Claymore. When I, when I wrote Granny, Granny Claymore, I had... I had a couple of detractors that were like, she's, a, she's an old lady, she can't move like this. I'm like, God damn it. Suspension of disbelief is a thing. <laughs> Actually, let's stoop her. get her more aggro looking. The great thing about doing these kinds of sketches in black and white is they can be really quickly laid out with such a minimal effort, especially when you throw in things like a smudge brush. Maybe one shoulder is exposed.
I know I want to tie one of the things I've been thinking a lot about for this story is I want to tie the the bodily progress of pregnancy to the myth and to like the ideas of, of the harvest and corn and things like that. So I wanted to include the Linnea Negra in there. That's I mean, that's for way down the line, you know, near the end of the story when she's uh, nearing uh, ready to uh, give birth. But um, I wanted to tie that into this all like it's it's in the same way that that all of my favorite myths are like explanations for things. I want to do the same thing. Like I want to touch on uh, moments where the story explains why the body does what it does or why uh, plants or animals behave the way they do, etc. I really love those shark tooth adzes, the uh, like a block sword thing. These shark teeth are obsidian. They would knock and uh, what's that called? Uh, when you um, break obsidian or glass to make it into um, into arrowheads and blades, I forget the word for that. Uh, they would do that and make these monofilament level sharpness materials that were so sharp you could eviscerate the bone um, in a single swipe you know sharper even than steel I mean at this even now they make scalpels out of out of these uh, out of these kinds of materials because you just can't it's really hard to get um, that level of sharpness with that level of durability out of metal like ceramics, they do, like there's ceramic scalpels and things like that. Kind of over the top, eh? I think big crazy earrings would be cool. I know that Jade, so Jade, although a big part of the culture wasn't necessarily commonplace, it was one of those things that was sort of just privy to the really wealthy and royalty, which are often the same thing. But maybe onyx or something like that might be cool to decorate our nuns with. Got a rough sketch there. Already my, uh, I mean, this happens when you're doing just rough sketches with, uh, with value, but we definitely have some, some pretty major, um, proportional issues with the figure. So I'll just figure them out as I go. I'm not too fussed. And what's cool is, you know, as you paint, you might come into happy accidents, you know, that help you with your design. You just never know where, where the accidental influence will take you. So it's a good idea to just welcome it and not try so hard to make something specific at this stage. So spicy today. Hmm. Do a new layer and pick a dark color and a new brush. Sometimes I get brush fatigue. I don't know if that happens to y'all, but like, I just get tired of you of specific marks that I'm making. Go in and mush that down. I don't like any of that. I tend, like many artists, I tend to really draw initially on the face. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Just so long as you know when. 
when you want to not do that, you're able to. If it's the only way that you can that you can attack an image, it can it can be a crippling thing. I think one of the things that I think is going to happen, I, I, I don't have any of the reference right now for it, um, but one of the one of the visual influences that I'm pulling from, um, as problematic as it is, is Apocalypto, because the costume design and the world design in it was just incredible. Story being what it was, director who they are, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't really matter. The point is, is just visually, I think uh, there was some good stuff to pull from. So we're gonna do uh, some of that. We don't want it to be our primary, you gotta be careful. When you pick an influence to, to let it be an influence, but not a primary uh, uh, visual factor. I want it in there, but it, I don't want it to be that. Yeah, I want to make sure I get this these anatomical features. See how quickly uh, and it, it's and how easy it is to to fall back on what is the norm for design for drawing. Like just instantly, I start drawing aquiline features, very like European. This is not a European story. These are not European characters. This is this is way before uh, anything like boats are going to arrive on their lands, you know. And again, this isn't history. It's not real. But I want to make sure that there's not any. Um, I'm not letting my own biases, considering the culture I'm coming up in and that I represent affect this design. I want it to feel natural and, and of its place. Not easy. <laughs> there will be struggle here. I really love the almond eyes of this girl right here. So beautiful. Look at that. The hooded the hooded uh, shape of the of the eyelid. And then notice how the eye socket kind of just snuggles the fat right there at the base of the eye. That's such a cool feature. It's that almond eye shape. But she doesn't have the epicanthic folds. So we want to kind of capture that, see if I can get it in the drawing. Maybe not now, uh, but did I ever do studies of certain feature types before even starting to really sketch on the original images? Yes, um, of course. I've done lots of studies of different uh, of different facial features and things like that over the years, um, but we are basically doing that right now. That's what this is: is is trying to. I mean, we are starting at bare bones. Um, I'm, I am familiarizing myself right now with you uh, in front of you. So I mean, we're going to be making. You're going to see me making a lot of mistakes, a lot of back and forth. Uh, this happened when I was working on Maggot in particular. If, if you've seen the artwork for that story, it's set in, in Mumbai, uh, like al almost 150 years in the future from now. So the population there is like uh, something like 53 million in one city. It's insanely overpopulated. And the whole concept is sort of like the people versus the rich, you know, very sort of basic. But I remember when I first started doing paintings for that, I kept painting this little white kid. And I could not get him to look like a, a, a street kid from India. It took me days and days, and I had to send it to my friends. <laughs> Shreya, <laughs> hey Shreya, welcome. I had to send it to my friends uh, that are familiar with the faces in order to pull it off. And it was, it was a challenge, but I knew that it had to be right. It had to feel authentic. And that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna work really hard to make this authentic and, uh, and accurate to the peoples, even though it's not meant to be those peoples. I've, Avid, oh, thank you so much for watching. Appreciate that. Love having y'all here, it's so great. Yeah, Shreya is an amazing artist. Y'all should check her out. Her work is incredible. And in fact, I was talking about uh, Maggot. She was one of the people that I sent my work to to get her opinion on stuff. She was invaluable um, in the artwork and the storytelling. She read my story. I, how many times did you read that, Shreya? 
three times? <laughs> you poor deer. All right, you know what I'm gonna do because I don't wanna lose it. I really don't wanna lose the shape. I'm gonna do a copy merge and paste it. And we're just gonna put her down here so I can constantly reference her. I really love the shape of her jaw, uh, the, the cheekbones and the eyes. So great. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna throw out the cheek, oops, I'm, see this? Ooh, Photoshop, you fucker. All right, I'm going back to my drawing layer. I want that cheek, but yeah, gotta get it. What's cool about doing this kind of exploration too is if you if you stumble onto things that work and that you like, but maybe aren't for the character that you're after, it's almost like you're casting uh, for a role in a movie. So you're you're the director, you've got a bunch of, of actors coming in and they're reading lines to see, uh, they're reading lines for a specific role. And some t this happens all the time where like the person is reading for a specific role and you're like, nah, you're brilliant, but you're not fit, you're not what we're looking for for this. And then they end up casting them for another role. I mean, it happens all the time. Look at any tons of, especially like uh, very high numbers of people in, in like a group. Look, think Joss Whedon, like that kind of story. Anything that's got lots of members in a big group happens all the time. So we're doing the same thing. We're just exploring and uh and digging around and you know maybe this won't be this this won't be bloodflower this will end up being her best friend whose name is uh one deer we don't know it doesn't matter because we're just exploring we're letting them we're letting them uh cast for us and and try out their parts and we'll see i love the sweep of this nose it's so beautiful I, I wish there was more Maggot too. Um, in fact, uh, it's, it is on my list. I am thinking very much, I'm using Bloodflower as my prototype, but I'm thinking about going back to all of the stories that I really loved and doing, uh, giving it the same treatment of making an illustrated novel out of the thing. Like uh, my, mo my model for this is Tales from the Loop and uh, Electric State by all by Stallenhog. So we're kind of, my thinking is kind of doing something similar, like making a very narrative heavy uh, art book and seeing if people like that. I really hope they do, because I love telling stories. Shreya is brilliant. Everybody should follow Shreya. Her work is incredible. The lighting is really on point. And I love that she has such a unique uh, approach to the fantasy stuff. I love it. So, so sweet. Loki originally tried to be Tom Hiddleston. Uh, uh, he applied for Thor. He cast for Thor. Wow. I did not know that, but completely believe it. That would have been a very interesting. Can you imagine like alternate universe, alternate universe Thor? Could, that would have been great. The nostril here is, is so important and the muzzle. So we're definitely gonna, I'm gonna just draw in the muzzle shape. Draw the mouth on top. I find this is a good, by drawing in the, the mound of the muzzle first, you know, as it connects to the nose, as it follows around the nose, especially in, in three quarter view, I find it's the best way to map out the curve of the mouth because the curve of the mouth should never follow directly the curve of the, the flat plane of the face. Because if you were to just peel off my skin right now and look at the skull, right? That the the teeth and the jaw from the nose sweep forward like a muzzle, just like a gorilla or even, um, you know, I mean, almost any animal, the, the eating apparatus needs to come out in front of the sensory apparatus, right? So humans are no different. <laughs> No worries, Shreya. Take care of that little one. I like the, 
the thinner upper lip. There's almost like a... I don't know. There's a, a taut quality to it. And then look, look here at this amazing... So you have at the base of the lip that little shelf that I don't know if you if you all were here for the, the last talk where I was talking about faces there's that little shelf of the lip but also she's got the meat of the of the muscles and the little fat underneath that that create that ledge and hers is very unique and I think that might be something that we're going to also grab onto as we do our sort of uh, proto Aztec proto Mayan characters This ear is 100% garbage. Delete. Unacceptable. I hate it. All right. I'm okay. I'm just passionate. Okay? Okay. Okay. So, interesting thing, historical-wise. Uh, the Mayans did practice some pretty severe body modification. Um, from birth, they would do things like skull modeling and uh, a really common thing that was done uh, back then. It was, it, I believe this is one, it's, this is classic, this always happens, right? You all know the story of why we have white, white wedding dresses, yeah? So we didn't, it, white was not a common color. It was, for most people, it was just not something that you could get is white cloth that stayed white. So people got married in all sorts of colors, but not commonly white and then a uh, a queen or a princess in england did it and it just became the norm uh same thing with uh, the accent in the the lisp of um of spanish in spain it, it that was the result of a, of somebody high up a king i don't remember which one but one of the kings had a lisp and it just became fashionable to have the lisp and then it just became part of the culture uh so this happened in in the history of the Maya as well. There was a leader or some uh, some person of great import that was considered quite beautiful was slightly cross-eyed. So they would train their young to be cross-eyed by putting things that would force their when they were really young that would force their eyes to slightly cross. This is all information that I picked up by reading online. So, <laughs> grain of salt that shit. I am sure that I will end up with some historian in here that's going to just tear me to shreds. Totally fair. Half of what I'm doing here is just telling stories. I wanted to make art and tell stories. And not all stories have to be necessarily true. So here's a question. Do I go for realism in body type? Do I go, do I push it? Because her proportions in the, in the initial sketch are a little bit off. More naturally, it would be something like, we would need a rib cage that roughly matches size and shape of skull. So her rib cage is already too big. The baby bump, hips would be much higher. And I've made her shoulders a little too over the top, but that's all right. This is an exploring stage. We don't need to make it perfect. Can't wait to see how this turns out. You love the world and ideas. Are... Aw, do you like blood flower? I was worried that it would be a little too, I don't know, a little too weird. And then I looked it up and there actually is a flower called the blood flower. And it kind of, it looks like... It, it's this beautiful little orangey looking flower, weirdly not red, or at least the ones that I saw were not red. And, and I liked it, I felt it kinda, if you were to name a child after a flower, it was also called blood flower, why not? Thanks for hanging, Trey, if, if you're taking off. So great to see you on here. So we're just doing rough, um, figuring out sort of placement now, uh, uh, rudimentary musculature. The 
pose that I have doesn't match the facial expression really, so I'm gonna kind of like let the body fall off here, like I did the, the other one, and that's okay. Again, we're just kind of toying around, looking for happy little accidents, planting seeds for ideas. Look again at our top. Kind of swells out a little bit, of course, to follow the curvature of the breast line. I've got kind of a rough face shape, a head shape, so when you're when you're doing decoration like you know the necklaces or the hats or you're trying to put armor on something you want to it's a good idea to kind of draw out and draw through the figure like I'm doing here just so that the the objects that you're placing and decorating and draping onto your figure feel uh, three-dimensional and placed on purpose uh, you don't want them to dig into the figure at all you want them to, to to, to rest on top. They need to exist in their own space. It's tough, but it's worth it um, taking the time to draw the figure first, even though you may not see any of the figure. We, you know, if you're doing a character that's wearing like motorcycle armor and a helmet, it's still a good idea to draw the figure first if you struggle with um, getting the, uh, the drapery and clothing to feel like it's accurate and on, and on the right figure, or on the figure correctly, on the right figure. Let's take a look at some of our decoration. I kind of want to bring in some of the corn motif on the headpiece. I really like this one. I love the, I love wrapped scarves. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it on some of my characters. I just love things wrapped around the head and the face. Big earring, maybe even like little facial details. So again, part of the thinking that I've got for her is that she is a she is an a an acolyte priestess. She is not. I don't want her in the story to have become a full priestess because when when she encounters this god and decides to sleep with the god, uh, I, I need her to be questioning, you know, her budding youthfulness and sexuality and things like that. Like, am I making the right decision by becoming a nun and sacrificing all of this stuff? You know, sacrificing a normal woman's life to be closer to the gods. What, what does that entail? Um, oh yeah, that's, that's fun, I like that. So uh, she won't be, she won't have the decoration, the same decoration that a high, a high priestess would have. So some of this stuff is probably too much. This is, and this is going to be, as I design this character, this is going to be one of the, one of, I know this will be a continuing problem and difficulty is to make sure that she feels uh, indigenous inspired and also, you know, with a little bit of the dark fantasy that I do thrown in, but but also of a lower rank. She needs to feel and evolve into being a badass, but as the character starts, she needs to be a lower rank. And that's kind of, that's a challenge in and of itself to make something cool, but also pull it back just a tad so that uh, there's, there's possibility for development so that the character can become more cool as they evolve as they uh, poke evolve to the next Charmander level. Shut up, I know Charmander's the bottom one. I played Pokemon for all you was born. On Game Boy without color. Ha! Maybe this is actually like a detail, I don't know. I don't like the lotus blossoms I did there. Let's look at our reference again. Some great headpieces, but again, I want her to feel a little lower in rank. I don't want her to be, you know, top dog. 
it's not going to have all the coolest accessories. Cool accessories are always saved for the, the highest rank. Well, almost the highest rank. There's an old story, and I don't, I don't believe it's actually turned out to be true, but there's this old story that kind of follows the tradition of, of um, martial arts. So like uh, karate or whatever, the early, the early versions of, of how it's been described would be that you would show up to study under, and I, I, again, I think this has been disproved, but it's a cool idea. The, that when you show up to study, you're given your, your plain white strip of cloth to be your belt. And then through the years, as you, as you uh, train and make it dirty and wash it and get blood on it and roll around in the dirt and all, all manner of stuff, it gets dirtier and dirty, dirtier until, you know, finally becoming uh, so uh, stained. No matter how much you wash it, it's black. And then as the years continue and, and you train and train and train, at some point, the cloth loses its integrity and fades to the point that it's white again. And that's sort of like a, an allegory for the master's journey. That you, you train, you, you, you spend your, your youth almost sacrificing to master something. And then once you've fully actually attained that mastery, you realize that, one, you you have there's so much to learn that you'll never master at all but at the same time you become relaxed as though a beginner again because you don't you realize that you don't need to struggle like that anymore I hate these headdresses so we're going to get rid of that I don't like it try something else I like the singular flower that might be in keeping with her name Part of this could also be that the silhouette that I have behind her is throwing it off. Could be that this, maybe there's symbolism of like peyote. That's a very common um, archetypal symbol in uh, Mesoamerican art, uh, ancient Mesoamerican art. And it would make sense for priestesses as hallucinogens were, are a common, even to this day are common in uh, natural medicines like that. I don't, want to, I don't want her to get like full on anime. <laughs> it would be so easy to turn her into Naruto or something. Yeah, I gave it a hard R. Let's back off the headdress for a second because it's not working. Let's go back to hair. With that narrow hairline. Let's uh, get rid of this for now. Yeah, I think there's something, you know, a little bit to this kind of squire hair that lends to the idea of, of being a novice nun. And maybe the headdress is something that's picked up down the line. I want her to be definitely, to, to have that dark melanin, you know, the rainforest, the sun. Her, her skin hasn't really known cloth kind of deal. Dark and rich colors will be really important here. And for those of you that have followed my work, you know I just didn't really enjoy different skin types as I, as I paint. Maybe a little baby bump. This is another thing is I'm thinking in, in a lot of ways, what I'm doing is kind of sacrilegious, right? Like I'm taking a, I'm taking a, uh, Judeo Christian story and then applying it to, uh, a, another people's and then through their rule system and their, their myth system and changing it. I mean, of course it's got to, ch it can't go the same way. Cause we're talking about a completely different people's. But uh, it's so fun to have that as a start. I mean, nobody can really complain about that kind of thing. There's so much stuff influenced by these 
myths and stories and religions. But I'm a sympathetic person and I do I do care. I wanna I wanna tell an original story without really hurting anybody, obviously. Again, when you find yourself noodling on a design, especially this early on, and this is, a, this is something I have many of my friends and coworkers in the past can attest to, I am super guilty of, is I just lock in. I find something I like and laser focus and then that's it. But we're going to avoid that today because we're trying, trying something new. We're trying to explore together. And obviously, if you have input or there's things you like, please lean in. Um, I'm doing this with you all on purpose because I want to, I would love to hear your thoughts about the story, about the myths that are inspiring these things, imagery, whatever, lean in, share your thoughts. We're all interested. You know, one of the things that really inspired me looking into Mesoamerican history was uh, my very first game job. Right after I got out of college, I got a job at uh, an Activision studio called Neversoft. Excuse me. Which was originally known for doing a very American pop culture game called Tony Hawk. I don't know if any of you remember that, but the Tony Hawk skate uh, was a, a skateboarding game very very gamified um especially in the beginning there was no actual logic to it at all it was more about like kind of the game was more about finding a flow line and then just kind of doing tricks along those lines oh yeah tony hawk so when i started i started on a game that they were trying to break that that uh long running tradition of doing these kind of skater punk games they made a game called gun which came out years before Red Dead Redemption. But basically what we were trying to make at that time was Red Dead Redemption. It was a Western and it was a, it was very gritty, um, pretty dark. It had cool Western themes. The owner of the company, um, Joel, I, I forget his last name uh, off the top of my head, uh, was from Montana and was super into like Westerns and stuff like that. And, and he was also, he was a guy who had a huge handle, a huge, bushy mustache, had had a real thick accent, you know, Montana style, and, it, you know, grew up very cowboyish, and he was a total cowboy, but also loved to skateboard. So this this guy would just, he would shred. It was awesome having a having a boss at a corporation that would do that. So we'd, we'd all go skating together and stuff. It was super cool. Anyway, he was super into this, uh, into doing this Western, and that's what I got hired for was to work on this Western originally. And uh, um, what what was I talking about with the Western? Oh shit! <laughs> I get so caught up in, in the details of the story. Sometimes I forget where I was taking it. Oh uh, right, the how I got into Mesoamerican uh, history. So I was working on Gun, and we were coming around the end of it. And the story we had a pretty the story was pretty worked out. Um, you know, we were we were in Alpha, I think, or pre Alpha, something like that. And there was already talk about taking it into a sequel. And so myself and uh, the, I believe he's an art director or lead concept artist over at Naughty Dog now, Aaron Lamonic and I, who I went to college with, um, we did, we built like a prototype idea, kind of like what I did with, with uh, Bloodflower as a God of War uh, sequel. Uh, we built, we did art, we wrote story and stuff like that. And I started reading about Mexican history in regards to the Old West. And the American public education system when it comes to our own history is so lacking. It's awful how much detail 
is either omitted or glossed over. I learned so much about American history by doing that project um, and about, you know, how deeply American Mexico is and how huge it is in terms of being a part of our country. And I don't just mean that, that you know, we took part of Mexico and turned it into the U.S. or trades or even the wars. There's so much that's intrinsically part that, that these two countries couldn't exist without each other. They are, they are siblings in every respect of the word. And uh, the history that I was picking up, I was like, this is insane. There were revolutions and wars, um, farmers uprisings, all this incredible stuff. Like uh, the first uh, documentaries, they took, they took uh, Hollywood was just starting out when like revolutionaries were taking over trains and shit. So they would take out those old like cranky hand cameras and film Pancho Villa raiding trains. Like that actually happened and no one knows this stuff. So I, what we were talking about was basically this very uh, Southwestern focused story. And I learned a ton. And by getting into that, I started really researching Mexican history, especially in the global sense. And man, yeah, what a rich and amazing culture and an incredible history. I learned so much. And again, just it's just stuff that's not taught. And then you throw in things like I was talking about before, like myth and and legends and the things that we consider kind of, you know, the normal legend, like Arthurian legend, right? These are just gimmies. Like everybody knows Lady in the Lake. Everybody knows, you know, uh, the Cyclops or the Minotaur. These are all, these are all common cultural knowledge, almost genetic knowledge for everybody that grows up uh, in in cultures inspired by uh, Western European society. And there's so much out there that's just missed. The very rich um, history to pull from, and that's part of kind of what what inspired me, right? So like. The having all of this stuff, all of this extra stuff that no one had ever heard of, or when I say no one, I say that in a very Trumpian fashion. Of course, there are people that are specialists, you know, there's people that are super into this, but I mean, this is not common knowledge. And I was like, damn, there is so much content here to make stuff with, and it is just not commonly known stuff. I can, I, I had tons of stuff to pull ideas from. So it kind of made sense, you know, it was almost a, a natural evolution to start exploring this and, and trying to, I want to introduce people to these, these different, these different stories and these different kinds of stories, because they really do just kind of, they, they live in a different space. They require a different headspace to even kind of follow them. And part of that is like what I was talking about in the very beginning, understanding the different relationships with death that these ancient cultures had and how they, you know, have evolved over the years into the modern uh, Mexican citizen now and the modern religions now and how they still hearken to these times and have these little amazing tidbits. I love crazy headdresses. I always will. Apologies if I get too passionate about my storytelling stuff. <laughs> Certainly not meant to put anybody off. I just think it's so cool. Um, same thing. Let's get some... Uh... You know what? I don't like that I left this without pupils <laughs> now that I'm looking at it. Well, certainly there may come a point in which she has no pupils. That's not where we're starting. Even the angles that I use initially to start with are so aquiline. They are so um, 
Caucasian. Eye, almond shaped eyes. Lovely. And then strong cheekbones. These are going to be very defining features for all my characters in this story. Softer chin. It's a very common, um, the, the, even to the point where we kind of consider that beautiful. Like, you got to think about all of these things that are just givens for our cultures, right? What What is considered beautiful globally within any given culture and why? So things like a strong chin is something that we always think about. Strong jawline. What if, what if we're talking about a culture where a weaker chin is more attractive? These shapes are just different and beauty is different here. <laughs> I agree. Uh, honestly, the, the best history class, I hated history when I was in high school. But when I got into college and I actually started getting professors that were really into this stuff and they were passionately shared and they made it real, like they, they were able to take these stories and, and, and make the context of them clear to me, man, they made it so much cooler. They really did. Like, uh, for instance, I, took, I had a Greek myth teacher that just made it come alive. I mean, Greek, I was always into myth and I loved Greek myth, but the way he explained Greek culture and history and how that applied to the myth, it totally changed my experience with the myth. It was incredible how much it changed. Yeah, the pinched hairline is very, it's something you do see, even even these days you will see it uh, with folks with a little bit more native blood. Go to the underlying layer. I know that uh, I did. I did say that um, one of the things I'm I'm looking at in order for in, in terms of my reference is. Um, oh shit! I've done it again. Uh, cut paste. Whoops. Shift paste so it goes back in the same spot. I want to keep these on separate layers. Um, but yeah, one of the influences I'm pulling from is Apocalypto, and I really loved the really thin, um, the, the either shorn or very thin drawn in hair of the eyebrow for the women, especially in the high society characters, excuse me, from, uh, from the movie. I thought it looked really cool. So we're going to try and that's something I'm going to try and use in here for our priestesses. And I like the idea of making a main character that has non-traditionally Western beauty. I think that's going to be really important. I mean, even they did it. I thought that they managed to make um, Glenn Keane, I think it was the one that did, that did the design. But for uh, Pocahontas, they managed to capture a lot of the features and still kind of tie it back into Western standards for beauty, which is, I mean... It's a Disney movie. It is what it is. But uh, they they made it different enough that she is unique. She doesn't look like any of the other Disney princesses. And I'm just one of those people that I'll take that way, way further than anybody ever asked. <laughs> but it is, it's just, it is what it is. I am who I, I am, yams who I yams. Hopefully you're watching because you enjoy that. And Bloodflower is tough. My thinking of her is that she will be she will be a woman that that trusts the opinions of her elders and her friends, but knows her own mind. And in the end, follows what she thinks is right and what she knows to be right which will take us through her story. Because compelling characters, in order to have a compelling character in storytelling, you have to have a character that, that has agency, that makes choices, that, that 
has clear reasonings for things. Even the villains of good stories should should make their choices and, and should have agency. There's nothing uh, that'll kill a story, in my opinion, faster than a character where stuff just happens to them. There's lots of examples of that, I think, even in, even in popular storytelling. But the stories I love personally are the ones where a character has, you know, some vital essence that, me that makes them compelled to do the things. You know, the story doesn't happen to them. They, they make the story just by virtue of their decisions. I've made her too old here. Um, just just with these facial features, but I really like the design as it is. I'm gonna keep it, and again, it's like casting. Maybe this is our high priestess, and and who is going to be our one of our primary villains in our story. Um, I really wanted to kind of think about the concept of you know the immaculate conception from the perspective of of uh, you know a religious leader that that wants to maintain the illusion of control. And if somebody, let, let's say you've got like a really hard televangelist or somebody like that these days, right? And then you go up to them and tell them, you know, I've met Jesus. He's living under the 405 overpass and he's real. And they would never believe him. They would never believe you. Even though the very religion that they're basing a lot of this on it is dependent on that kind of belief and trust in other people and, and in and in their their creator whoever that may be right uh but there's a lot i think there's tons of examples that could be set that could be put forth to prove that that as time develops the concept of who is believed to actually be holy or or of that deity or whatever is very subject to the whims of the people that are in power and in control. So how would, if, if you had a situation where you had a nunnery or, or a, a convent, right? And all of the girls and young women that are there are following these very specific, very strict rules of abstinence and things like that. And then one turns up pregnant, what's gonna happen, right? So that's kind of my thinking for the, the uh, the abbess, that's what I've been calling her, is the abbess, which is the female version of an abbot. And uh, this convent that she runs. I don't, I, do, I see myself doing these, like, the, I just did the, the little nun collar. Mm -mm. There, I want this to be wholly inspired by the specifics of the region I'm, and, the, and the myths I'm pulling from, but also amped to the next level fantasy version of what it is. But it's, it's, this is what I'm going to be fighting throughout this story and throughout this, the art for this story is my own biases coming at it as a Western style artist. So the symbolism and the easy, the, the easy sort of visual notes that can tell people what this is are going to be what come to my mind first. And of course, there's no way I can escape them. That's just not possible. But I, I want to lean on them as little as possible and, and challenge myself to make it clear that this is an abbess without her wearing, you know, a nun's, flying nun's uh, hood thing. I forget what it's called suddenly, the habit. Talking so much. <sighs> My throat's hoarse. You love that passion about anything in people. Have you read, have I read anything by Brandon Satterson? You, lo uh, you love his world building. I actually did read the metallurgic ones. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the first one. I read the first three books and his world building is on point. Uh, he's really, really good at taking us a, a simple concept and then just extrapolating from there. And the idea that magic uh, comes from different kinds of metals and metal use. It's such a cool idea and it felt really, really fresh and it's what kept me in the story for a really long time. I loved the religion that they had, that, that uh, sort of authoritarian, yeah, Mistborn, that's it, thank you. The authoritarian religion that he wrote that hunt these sort of metal magic users and how they use magic in their own, use the metal magic in their own way in order to hunt, it was so cool. Great world building. 
My problem with it ended up being character, uh, character specific. But I think uh, the guy really is a, is a great uh, world, build, world builder. So if, if I'm kind of taking this as this character into the abbess, right? She's kind of going to be the opposite of our main character in that she is a, a character of great position and power. So her costume might be very uh, ornate in comparison. One of the things that I think can happen when you're working with, uh, you know, the roots of when, when you're working with a fantasy that's built on the roots of an indigenous culture or an indigenous history is a lot of a lot of writers and a lot of artists get fixated on this kind of noble savage trope and i think that's a huge mistake because there is so much history and iconography and color and design in these cultures and in many of them they're they're extinct or near extinct so to just simplify them is I, I, I think it's a huge loss. If you've ever seen my design, I did a design of uh, way back. I did for a character design class. I did this design of a Treyu from um, uh, the Neverending Story. I did a redesign of a Treyu and a couple of other characters from the, from the book, uh, the original book concept. And the Atreyu that they did for the movie was exactly what I'm talking about. They basically, you know, it was just like a, a tunic top and, you know, he might as well have been running around with a feather. What what I did instead was I picked a specific, um, a couple of very specific indigenous groups and basically rewrote these people so that they weren't uh, exactly the same concept as sort of like s central Native Americans that hunt buffalo. I made them like uh, South American inspired, where they hunted with, with instead of bows, they used a, he used a Treyu uses a blowgun. And uh, if you go and look through, check that out. I don't, I don't know, I don't know where the link would be now because it's such an old piece. But um, I, I much preferred taking him into the realm of this this very highly uh, decorative and ingenious indigenous people instead of a simplified uh, tunic, if you will. Since we're going fantasy, what if we did what if we did something like that? That's something to think about, is that there is magic in this. It's a very specific kind of magic, but all of these all of these nuns are bloodbenders. That was so cool. I'm kind of seeing her almost as like a, oh, what's his name? What was the dad's, the, uh, shit. Tyrion's father's name of the, the, the eldest of the Lannisters? It wasn't Tyrell, was it? No, that's, I'm thinking of, I'm mixing that up with uh, uh, <laughs> Blade Runner. Shit, I can't, Tywin, thank you. Yes, Tywin Lannister. She's got kind of this Tywin Lannister thing going on. Cool, I dig it. Um, we're gonna put her away now. This is how I do a lot of my s sketching with things as I try and figure them out. It's just very kind of loose, um, rough exploration. Let's turn her off for a minute. Let's find somebody else to fixate on for a little while. I think maybe this lady. Copy merged. Paste. Ginger ale. Carbonated goodness. Also makes me burp like crazy. <laughs> All 
All right, so again, focusing on head. This time I kind of want to see if I, what, what I can do with the profile, which is more in line with this character here. I'm gonna keep pushing. I, I think maybe with this one, we'll push stylization a little bit more and I'm gonna push the, the shapes a little bit more to be more fantastical, more, uh, not quite animation, but certainly more designerly. I'm gonna really pull that forehead back, really make it about the nose and the eyes, make give her like very high, aggressive predator eyes maybe. What if she had a shaved head? That'd be kind of cool. What if the nuns shaved their heads? We will have to turn her on again because I love her nose so much and her eyes. I'm gonna have to remember, this is gonna be a really important feature I know for all of the characters I do, is this nostril. It's very much like mine, but mine is got kind of rounded. I like how high and, and kind of pitched that triangle is on her nose. It's really cool. kind of got a like a bitchy Cusco thing going on there I, I dig it <laughs> I loved the Emperor's new groove I really did brilliant <laughs> that movie still makes me crack up maybe the Labre piercing Road to El Dorado is great. So great. I forgot the uh, uh, the character's name. The female con artist. Oh, she's so awesome. Chul? Was it Chul or something like that? As a young Easy, that was a very confusing character for me. <laughs> Strange times. Uh, adolescence. Well, not even adolescence. I think it was a full-on teen at that point. <laughs> Her hips did not lie, as they say. I think I'm losing just a touch of femininity here. So I'm gonna try and structure this mouth just a little bit differently. I still want that chin, that, that weaker chin. See, the, again, this is the difficulty when you're working outside of standard symbolism for what these things are. I mean, this is a real challenge I've bitten off for myself.
We watched a video essay on El Dorado by Bread Sword on YouTube. Great video makes you appreciate all the attention, genre, animation, storytelling, and filmmaking. It's a brilliant movie. It's one of those just super underrated films. Um, yeah, I agree. Great storytelling. The background art was fantastic. Uh, another one is Prince of Egypt. It's just that that period of animation. There was a lot of really great stuff. Let's uh, throw in a. I love these these discs. This might even be a thing that I'm going to end up using. So I want to make a note of it for myself. But these discs kind of woven into and on top of each other is like heavy beads. Cool idea. I'm going to pull pull that aside and make a note. Yeah, I think she, I think she's feeling a little uh, a, a tad more feminine, but still kind of has that tough look. I really like um, doing animation stylization. The problem that I have with it is I am awful at staying on model. So I cannot, I can't draw the same figure <laughs> multiple times and have it read pretty clearly. I, I have to depend on very um, strict, uh, like icons for specific characters. Like this character has a big stripe on their face and that's how you know who this one is because that's a major weakness of mine. <laughs> I remember when I was working at Sony on God of War all the time uh, I'd have to, I used to work with Andy Park, who's now one of the uh, VizDev leads or heads at Marvel. Um, he did Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp and several, several other amazing pieces uh, of film. But uh, all the time, he also used to work on uh, the Tomb Raider comic, I remember. But all the time I, I would need to ask for his help because I could not, I could draw Kratos, I would dump the emotion that I wanted into it, but the, the, I could never get the accuracy right. So I had to constantly get help with that. I could paint, but painting Kratos was tough. I like that. It's kind of a proud Maybe there's a very thin brow. Mm, yeah, I think the more I take off, the more I'm getting there with her. Of course, her face to skull, like the, the, the cranium to face is way off. I'm going to have to really um, narrow that down. her ear is huge let's um, grab the entire cranium here I do want this slightly diminished cranium which is um, oops it's very indicative from the stone art if you look at the stone art particularly of the Maya uh, there is this really heavy emphasis on the face and the cranium kind of falls away a little bit but we're we're not going for that level of abstraction so I will, I do like the idea of that the pinched head of the, um, the body modifications, that, that slightly conical look. But it also kind of gives her a cool kind of punk rock feel to me. I don't know. What do you guys think? You guys can pipe in anytime. I'm just blabbing. Yeah, the head binding is specifically what I'm talking about, like the the pull, pulling back of that of the top of the skull there. So that's yeah, that's definitely kind of what I'm after. I don't want to I don't want to make it like that, like fully comical, but I want to hint at it. You know what I mean?
maybe the maybe there's paint or mud in her hair so that it's just hair on the bottom and the top parts like caked in mud and little bits of hair poking out I don't know I don't like those last little things I did there Damn it, come on, phone. Maybe bring this back a little. There's something, there's something in this note to myself that I really like. Um, we'll save her for sure. Put her up here. I, <laughs> you can probably tell already, but uh, I keep extremely messy sketchbooks. Some people make sketchbooks that are like immaculate, you know, like uh, the, the different images are all like evenly spaced and there's like you know they're laid out in loving manner mine are just they're like this it's just <laughs> it is a problem let's see what else we got let's do a let's get a, let's tr let's see if we can actually pull off a full body here even though i don't have much in the way of body reference The sound is okay for you guys? I'm just checking because I installed a noise gate for the fans I have going on in here because it is it is warm. It looks like the fans are not coming through, but I'm curious how my voice is in terms of starting and stopping. If it cuts off or it's weird. Okay. Just want to make sure it's the best media possible that I can make. Nope, nope, nope. Don't like that. Go away. We all have little tropey shapes that we make, and uh, it's so easy to get to just end up with those all the time. And so I, I when I catch myself doing one of my shapes, uh, I usually don't catch myself, but sometimes I do, and I try to get out of it as quick as possible. One of the things that we did learn or I learned for sure with uh, God of War was that, you know, by stooping the character, right, and making them really kind of aggressive and low, real aggressive poses. Right. Would make them feel tough or savage or badass. very dynamic it comes from comics and there's a reason it's used all the time it really works <clears throat> you didn't notice the noise gate <laughs> an S curve out here. So one of the things I've thought about when I've thought about creating the imagery for this is I wanted to make this character ultra savage and violent. I mean, it's going to be an extremely bloody story. Um, but at the same time, I wanted it to constantly have this awareness of like the the violence on top of the 
different structure. Like, because this was originally kind of an idea that I had with, um, uh, with God of War, I, I wanted to make something that was God of War-ish, but at the same time, was, every part of it screamed that it was not Kratos. So I wanted her to have this kind of savage, super tough feel as well, but I never wanted it to be something that, that sacrificed the shape and the, the feel of her actual body type, of being more slight. So she's more like, if Kratos is like a, a giant rampaging lion or rhinoceros, I will always kind of thought of her as more like a, like a panther. So I can't use the same poses that I would use were I designing her, you know, as a Kratos type character. And it's tough. I mean, pose design is, is a huge part of characters because it's going to contribute to the, the, um, the contours, the silhouette read of them. In many ways, when you're designing a character, you have to think about this as well. You have to think about how they move, why they move the way they move. To me, uh, a really great character design implies all of this stuff. Who they are, where they come from, what they do for work, how they move. I really think she would be great, like slinky. Incredibly dangerous. This is a woman that will tear your pelvis out of your body, <laughs> right? <laughs> She's meant to be the, the ultimate badass. And I kind of wanted to build on that, the, you know, the myth of the mom strength, right? The idea that, that a mom with her child in danger could lift a car and all that stuff, yeah? So building on that, but using actual magic behind it. So imbued with, the, with these abilities that her unborn child is giving her. And in, it ties into, it very much ties into the world building that I have for the magic in, in, in specifically the convent, right? So the convent is meant to be there, there are meant to be these kind of blood mages that use blood ritual and and that sort of thing. And so I'm tying that, I'm very cognizant of how that ties into things like pregnancy, uh, menstruation, um, uh, birth, and all of that stuff that's all coming into this. And that's all meant to be part of the power here. When you're writing a story and when you're doing design for a story like this, you want to have you want to have everything feel like it was like like it's all got the the same that's the word I'm looking for. Like it all has the same melody. That that if if it were a symphonic theme it's the visual equivalent of that symphonic theme that lets you know that this is this is Leia's theme, this is Luke's theme, um, this is the Imperial March, right? You want to have that same feel uh, with when you're writing, with your storytelling, and even with your art that supports that sort of stuff. That every element locks into place and supports the theme, and so uh, you know thinking about this from the beginning, right? So we're talking about an immaculate conception, birth, and again, blood. And I'm setting this in, in a place where blood and magic and death are all hugely important aspects of the culture and the mythologies uh, underlying it. And the magic, of course. I want to make decisions and, and introduce elements that are going to just be that are all going to sing with that little bit of melody and touch on that melody. Everything. 
the visuals, the color, the story, everything needs that melody. And the, the more stuff that rings true of your theme throughout the story, throughout the art, um, and, and, in, and in every element, everything that has that, the stronger and more tight that you make that, the better I think it will resonate with your reader or your viewer. I think that's why great theme is so important. And of course, theme is one of those things where like you can't, it's really hard to say this is my theme ahead of time. Even even to this stage, I'm saying this, this is my theme. This is what I'm doing, guys. Uh, here is my reasoning for everything. All well and good, but it really doesn't mean anything until it's done. Once the story is gonna, once the story at least is fully done, I'm gonna copy and paste this on my current body just to see how it feels. Um, once you have the story done, you go back. So you write the story twice, right? You do the initial pass where you have your rough ideas, then you read through it. And then you're like, oh shit, these are the themes that I had all along. I didn't even realize I was talking about this. That's gonna happen with this story, guaranteed. Uh, and as I go through, I'll adjust. And then when you write the story the second time, that's when you can purposefully go, okay, this is meant to touch on this. This is the melody. This is that, this is that moment. I'm just using it just for placement right now. I'm curious if, if that body fits that head. I think having a really long slender neck, which is, this is an interesting choice I'm kind of making right now and I'll probably have to go back on. This this is not indicative of the, of the, of the sort of physical characteristics and body types that I'm starting with, but you know, again, we're doing sort of a hyper fantasy version of this. Sunday stream. You got distracted from drawing robots. How were the robots? Were they juicy butts? We got Mish in the house. So I'm thinking, especially in the start, again, somewhat juvenile, not juvenile, but uh, you know, teens, late teens. I don't want to get too weird with it. <laughs> That's nasty. I want her to definitely have these sort of slightly feminine contours, you know. But also, there, she's, you know, of the jungle, svelte. In the end, I do not like what I did with this arm. Get rid of that. Sometimes when you're working with a figure and you want to show, like I want to show the hand, right? But it would be cut off if she was dropping it straight down. Well, that's okay. You can move the figure back in three dimensional space, right? Z depth is your friend. If you're doing a design and you want to show off some element, put it in Z depth instead. So this leg is coming forward. Hip and overlap, right? All right, so real quick, let's block in some shapes for clothing and whatnot. I really like the bead thing. I want to hint at, basically on account of the influences, I want to hint at the nudity that would be traditionally normal without technically showing it. Or at least not too much. I'm sure that 
uh, when we get to the actual illustrations of the book, I'm not going to censor myself that much. But for uh, Twitch purposes, we're going to be a little bit easier on it and not push our luck. Just a little bit here and there, just to tantalize, to titillate. Again, I didn't really get any skirts or anything, nothing for full body poses, which I should have done. I should have thought of that. One of my favorite uh, references that I use in tons of stuff was this. There's um, there's this really great collection of costuming through the ages, and it's a. I think somewhere it's actually a book. Um, but I've only ever found JPEGs of it online. And if you just look up like uh, costumes in history or something like that, you'll see these collections of like, it'll be like a lineup of different people of, a, of certain eras in costume, you know, the wealthy, the poor, like uh, how they wore their robes or how they wore tunics and hats and all sorts of stuff. It's so great. And they're all these like really simple line illustrations. And one of my favorites is uh, how the Greeks and the Egyptians in particular would fold their robes so that they could make decorative shapes, but with like two, one or two pieces of cloth. It's so incredible. And I always, I've looked at those images so many times now that I just think about simple cloth in that fashion where like how, how it would fold, how it would drape, um, and how you might use some clever knots to create completely different silhouettes. I, I want to do some kind of leg, cool leg detail, you know, beads, kukui nut kind of thing, heavy stones like these maybe. Let's go in on top with another layer and just kind of pull out some lines and see how we feel about some of the decoration, you know? Right through! For us to do that, we need a darker color. SMRT. So I'm quickly hinting at uh, depth, you know, implying ellipses for these beads. A nice quick way to kind of just chunk out some shapes. And if they follow the contours of the underlying structure of the body, it'll feel pretty right for a sketch, since it's just a sketch after all. I want these beads to be chonky. Gonna run, super fun to watch. Hey, thanks for hanging, Treya. Super awesome hearing from you. Hopefully you stop in in the future. Take it easy. Love for the fam and all. I haven't actually seen Shrey in a long time. Very briefly at Lightbox, we got to say hi. If y'all are doing arts and things like that, uh, one of the things I'm I'm finding now that I, that should have been obvious way back when, but that I'm finding are really really important for what we do. It's the culture stuff, having friends and and going to these events. Man, it's so big. Bova agrees. Yeah. <laughs> I 
So, I'm still thinking these beads... I, I may need to line them up a little bit nicer, make them a little bit more uniform to keep in keep within my my sort of corn maze idea. But I don't know. I'm liking these chonky beads. We'll see. I do like that overlap of leather that's holding it all together that I just noticed. So maybe there's like these little epaulettes of cloth or material. Maybe there's like feathers or something cool in them. I don't know. Yeah, being able to complain, talk about very specific art things. Yeah, like it's you speak the same language, right? So it's just, it's so great to be able to just whinge with somebody that understands. And not having to explain for the 300th time that no concept art is not animation, grandma. <laughs> It was one of the most amusing things of uh, with me living on the boat, right? And doing what I do, because I still kept kind of a similar schedule. I worked on my computer a lot, even when I was living on the boat. So I would be, you know, below decks and nobody would see me on the docks or in, in the anchorages for a while, because I would just be working and making artwork or writing and stuff. And when I'd pop out, they'd be like, what are you doing? Are you, are you down there drawing your cartoons? And I've told them, you know, 30 odd times what I do, how it works. You drawing cartoons down there? <laughs> so funny. I'm sure that's happened to some of you. There's a character, in, I don't remember his name, in, um, in Apocalypto, who has these amazing... Uh, his pauldron is made of, like, little chunks of skull. Looks so damn cool. I'm kind of thinking about maybe throwing that in there just to create a different shape. And then I think there were jaw bones even down at the bottom. But I don't know about that. Yeah. That's... That's the name of the game, Avid. It sucks, but it is... That's just part of the life. Trying, constantly trying to explain what you do to an audience that can't understand or chooses very vehemently not to. <laughs> brag, 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 Mish. <laughs> I'm rich! No, that is a pretty good final joke, though. I'll give you that. This head, or this neck I've made is much, much, much too long. A lot of these anatomy things that I do, I get caught up in the in the sort of animation-y figure line action I'm doing and kind of, you know, it gets a little wonky. It happens, it happens to everybody, don't feel bad. Is this the time, should I? Oops, try to throw in that belly. I really like the visual that I've always imagined for like the cover of this or, or for the pitch image is just a woman sort of in a forest, maybe jaguars behind her or something. Uh, very heavy in the belly, you know, like 8.8 .8 months in covered and drenched in blood. S super savage look on her face. Pure rage. That would look so cool. There is a scene in Apocalypto where one of the, the characters, the, the main female protagonist, she is pregnant. And she's, she beats the shit out of a, like a, a howler monkey in this amazing and very tense sort of battle scene. Very cool. I loved it. Definitely an, an inspiring image. You can do it! As they say.
Oh, hush, dog. I like the idea of her having kind of a, sl a more slight body type, which really accentuates the belly. Oh, hush. I'm not entirely sure if you guys will be able to send links in the chat right now since I don't have a, moder uh, a moderator for Sundays yet to uh, bypass the, the mod bot. But you're welcome to try. You can trick it by, you know, spelling out websites and stuff. I said you should try. Don't give up before you've tried. There you go. Brash and bold, I love it. I think some kind of cool pa I really like these modern patterns, but I, they might be too much. We'll have to do a simplified sort of pigment decoration instead. Of course, because our convent are sort of sorcerers of blood, a lot of blacks and reds will be common colors that they use. I think it'll be good to mix that maybe with some jade. And the white of the skull. Those early sort of primary colors of, of a culture rather than primary colors of the color wheel that we know. As we know it, anyway. <laughs> Color is just a theory. Like gravity and time. It's an interesting idea I've got. I'm not sold on it. Let's uh, merge it all down. Put it aside. Come on now. Push down. Go. New layer. Take a look at our reference again. <clears throat> what if we went more, go a little bit more um, kind of fantasy, a little bit less literal? I 
I like the idea that she stands with her shoulders really far back. Clavicle. Again, I keep kind of kind of pushing back and forth on this age thing, the body type. This is the time to do it though, just explore. The face is turning up, the ears are always low. Hard and fast rule. Unless the ears are grafted into a weird place. Then maybe. I really like these figures in, in, uh, or this facial, uh, anatomy and profile. The profile is so great. cartoony with my facial expressions there. These things happen. Flaring nostril in. Love it. It's probably a little bit more angry than I'm intending there. I def I'm definitely looking for her to be a hard ass, but like, you know. <laughs> A young, reasonable one, at least to start. This is the issue. When I'm doing these um, these character designs, I get, without the context of the environment, it can get a little bit overly animation-y. Because then it's all about capturing a great expression or a great pose. And then when you try and put them in an environment, everything gets lost. That's tough. And if I end up with a stylized character, do I want to make the environment stylized? That's such a such a huge question, you know. 
I know, dog. We'll go out in a minute. <laughs> Get some cheap internet points. Come here, you. Come here, you monster. Blech. Have you all met Kova? <laughs> That's my dog. This is Kova. He went with me out on my boat, my boat uh, missions. <laughs> He's a little stinky monster. <laughs> yeah, Kova's my sort of art mascot, getting me through everything over here. But man, what a brat! Oh, don't let her hear that. But she's very sweet too. All right, down you go. You go bark in the background and be annoying. Covered in dog hair, yes, I see. We'll be lucky if she doesn't knock over a bunch of lights on her way out. <laughs> Flip it again. Ate it. See, all it takes is just taking a minute to pat the dog and stop looking at the thing that you're working on and you get a chance to, uh, she's back there doing a dog stuff. Let me see if we can, you're doing dog stuff, Kova? <laughs> you playing dog games. Let's see if we can kind of erase something out of this. Maybe that's the way to do it. Different ways to get to the same point. Yeah, she's a cutie. Super cute, very sweet. Not the brightest tool in the shed. <laughs> but she's pretty great. Yeah, bless you. <laughs> you say that, but you don't have to tell intel intelligent dogs not to stare and bark at the sun either. <laughs> yeah, she's half blind now from uh, when we lived out on the boat. She would, she would, uh, I would catch her. I'd, I'd go and look up. I'd climb up the hatch because she'd be like, bar, 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 like for 15 minutes straight. And so I would sneak up and peek my head through the hatch of the boat to see what the hell the dog was barking at, thinking that it would probably be another dolphin orgy, which is another story altogether. And uh, Kova hates dolphins, by the way. <laughs> and I would go up there trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Thank you. It's very nice kisses. I'm telling stories about you. And... She would be sitting there, staring at the setting sun, super pissed off that the sun hurts. <laughs> so she'd be barking at the sun because the sun hurts her eyes. <laughs> oh, I have dog stories, my friends. It is. He's a fascinating specimen, I tell you. Sometimes I, I like doing my exploratory sketches like this where it's almost a painting instead because when it's not line work and you're kind of mushing around your values a little bit, you can kind of do lost and found and uh, you can lean a little bit more on the behaviors of the light and the form rather than the contours themselves to get what you're after.
The downside of when I work with this with this style is that I can get I I will often get really into the rendering of it and then I'll get fixated on some aspect and then I have to try and figure out how to make that work in other views. So it's it's a trade-off. A trade-off. that muscle I was talking about, a little bit of embouchure, the base of the mouth, it can be indicated with a single stroke, but if it's in the wrong spot or at the wrong time, it will not feel natural. You gotta be very mindful of these little uh, facial details and, and expressions. He certainly has a little bit more innocence and less kind of anger with these eyes. If I don't, if something's not working and just blend it out, again, it's one of the things I really love. It's almost like working with charcoal, like if you were to do a charcoal rub and just kind of erase out and kind of find lines and find lights. A very forgiving um, way to explore a sketch. When in doubt, blend it out. Damn right. I'm very tempted to kind of accentuate this sweep of the bridge of the nose, which is different. Um, by actually punching in a, uh, a piercing, a bridge piercing, but I don't know. I don't know if it'll work. It might be too much. Do a bust real quick. The erase out technique is very fun. So looking at her cheeks, we see the cheekbones themselves, we see that there's a very high plane up here. And then just falls off. Really stunning features. Of course, we need that nostril and that bridge. Hmm. We definitely lost uh, scope with these ears, but that's all right. As you said, when in doubt. What if 
This one has longer hair, maybe. I always like these, like, Pueblo-style uh, head wraps. Pretty fun. Although these are, these tend to be more desert, like Mexica, uh, kind of Apache, Navajo. Relax, we'll go in a bit. I'll lay down. Go home. Go home. Good girl. This one definitely looks much younger, okay? Top knot kind of look. Maybe there's something to that. Several of these uh, references kind of imply that that high, like a high top knot centered on the head. This one as well. Although I really like the punk rock uh, shaved head look. <laughs> we'll see. Nope, don't like that. Let's blend this back. Hmm, something like that maybe. I like how this one kind of takes it into the neck. Go a little bit lighter with our paint. It's a very fun way to do the black and white technique is, uh, you know, do the erase out with a mid-tone and then throw in some lights here and there as accent values. Very sexy. Maybe we continue the pattern of the tattoo or the face paint down onto the chest. Something like that. It's 
an interesting look. Grab a harsh brush. Real quick, throw in some rem lights just to cheat a little bit and juice it up. A little bit more brightness. All right, good enough. Move her out of the way, shrink her down. Keep going. I think uh, we'll make this the last one, the last sketch. Do a quick new study. And we'll have done a good quick run on our our very first sketches of, the, of our main character for this story. I'm gonna real quick, instead of instead of this time focusing on overall um, uh, drawing, we're gonna do a sort of find the features patchwork. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out. Take care. We'll see you in a couple days for the next one. We'll see if I'm able to get any further uh, on this on my own. I got to start doing my magic cards pretty soon here. Unfortunately, I can't do those on Twitch with y'all. Would be awesome. I think it'd be so fun. But sadly, no. Should all bring it up with the Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro. Hey, hey, we want to watch it made. We want to see how the sausage is made, y'all. Oosh. You know what I think it is? Part part of it is that this reference I got. She looks a little bit. Looks a little bit steamed. <laughs> Somebody's talking some shit about her beads. She's gonna mess them up. What's my favorite Magic the Gathering card to work on? The next one? That's the short answer. <laughs> um, I really like the ones where the, the assignment, some 
and this only happens every now and then, but every now and then the assignment will generate such a clear image in my head that it's almost like it's it's almost like it's already made. I really like those ones. Usually it's like a simple structure, a simple figure. It's it's a, a simple effect, but something that has a strong visual punch. Those are the ones I really enjoy. Doesn't always happen. It's pretty rare, actually. I'd say the last one that kind of did that in a set that's out, so the most recent, rather, the most recent in a currently public set would be the Peer, Peers Into Abyss painting. That one was like, yep, this is what I'm gonna do. And I sent them this the initial sketch that I, I mean, I painted it really fast, zoom, done. And they were like, oh yeah, this is the one, cool. All right. Sometimes it just flows like that. Not always, but sometimes. This one's got kind of a Mona Lisa smile thing going on. How can I make an interesting shape here? I want to do, let's try. There's something about like a a slightly world weary world weary look in a young person's face that's kind of intriguing. When you have a really soft uh, sketch like this, where there's not really any uh, super hard edges, it's very easy to warp it and not, you know, not lose your your details. <laughs> yeah, uh, you'll see that a lot when I'm drawing faces. I cannot help it; it's completely compulsive. I make the faces that uh, that I'm painting. I've never actually really filmed myself doing a whole lot of this kind of thing, so it'll be interesting seeing the the, uh, the footage for my highlights. Saying of which, if you all, when you're seeing the videos, if you see segments that you think would be good highlights, I'd appreciate it if you'd mark them for me, because when I go through, I gotta rewatch the whole thing.
Heterochromia is pretty cool, but I don't think it would go. I don't think it would fly here. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. It's not super hard. I know that it can be done. Like there's a little button here that says clip that, but I'm afraid to touch it because I don't know what will happen. <laughs> also, I do, in general, I don't really know what stuff, if, if I ever say anything that's kind of an aha or something useful to you that you think other people would find useful. I don't know which ones would be. The right ones. All right, let's. Since we've done the dark midtones, let's make a new layer. Grab something lighter. And dig in there with it. See what we can make. Kind of get this nice hook nose shape. A very cool feature. Yeah, this early definitely. It's entirely possible that I'll end up scrapping everything. Um, but it's just good to kind of familiarize yourself with these details. It's kind of like sketching out when you're gonna do a, you know, a design of a creature or something like that. Let's say you need to do a creature that's inspired by, you know, like a shark and a lizard and a mule. Well, it's a good idea to paint sharks, lizards, and mules before you get started on that because you're gonna notice little details, little features, um, little, uh, um, points of reference that are going to lend reality to that design and you want to be able to pull on that and the only way you can get that visual vocabulary is by actually painting the thing so this is not wasted time even if it's even if nothing is directly used it is indirectly very valuable Uh, sorry, Mish. Yeah, uh, you got to spell out the links for now, unless you subscribe. You attempted a clip. Ah, oh, jeez. See? has to have the last word.
think there's definitely something a little too regal about this one that's not not really screaming orphaned nun <laughs> but that's all right like i said nothing's wasted here we're just uh exploring and uh learning the visual vocabulary This is a uh, this is a really common illustration technique right here. What I'm doing, which is to take your focal points and and put the accent values only in the focal points. It works. Let's get rid of this and see. Yeah, good notes here. Hi, Frios. Uh, hi, do you ever feel maybe frustrated if you can't achieve or find what you're going for? Of course, I mean, that's, that's a really common feeling, I think, that everybody gets. Um, really, what's going to make it work in the long run is to just stay the course even when it's not even when you you're not hitting the thing is are are you hitting points that are getting you closer because it's it's like that journey to the mountaintop right you want to make sure that the decisions that you're make that you're making um that aren't quite getting you there aren't just moving you laterally but that they're moving you up and forward towards that goal of what it, what it, whatever it is you're after. Precisely, keep calm, scribble on. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's it's an endurance game. It's not a sprint, um, especially if you have something specific in mind. There's a really really amazing talk that um, Ira Glass does on taste and your evolution as an artist. And essentially, what he says is. Um, and I'm paraphrasing horribly because he really wrote this out really nicely. But uh, as you, at, when you start and you're creating some kind of work, be it poetry, writing, art, uh, filmmaking, whatever, uh, whatever drew you to that in the first place was your, yeah, it's a great quote, was your good taste. You have taste that is beyond your ability right now. And you have you know what you know that what you're making is not what you want and you know that a certain level is going to be good the fact that you know that is already huge it is proof that you're on the path you're on the right path and it's the uh, over time putting in the effort and and failing again and again and again for hours and hours is going to lead you because you have good taste and you're going to be making good decisions it will lead you where you want to be going um frustrations it's always going to be part of this and you got to learn to love the frustration you got to learn to like accept that part of it where things are just not going your way right now and it's going to happen and it's going to happen a lot and i don't care where you, any artist wherever they're at in terms of their career as they're developing, experience this. So the pro pro that you can possibly think of has their moments of doubt and has their moments where they're not 
pulling off the thing that they're trying to achieve. Um, just learn to love it. Accept that it's part of it. I'm trying to think if there's any kind of wisdom I can impart that helps with that. And it's, I guess, the way to think about it is like uh, how you would think about, mm, think about something that you really enjoy or something that you really like that requires some effort to make that thing happen. I guess in a way it would be like that, just un constantly altering your perspective to focus on the on the out the the long-term outcome rather than the short-term failure and the and really the challenge is learning to master that and get and get to the point where you enjoy the process where you enjoy the failure and understand that it is a step in the direction that you are actually in your failure you are pushing towards that goal and that's how things are achieved. It is a, a slow slog that takes effort and time and commitment and discipline. It's a great book called The Obstacle is the Way. Oh, I, I have not read it, but that sounds like precisely the kind of philosophy I'm trying to uh, uh, impart here. It is, when, when we're talking about something that, that's gonna be really important to you, like we are talking about developing your career, developing the skills necessary to pull off the career you're after, understanding that that, that process is, that, that the learning process is going to be this uphill battle against your own abilities versus your own tastes. It's gonna, it, that will be the, that's the level up unlock. Once you, once you get there, and you kind of just can rely on the fact that you know that you'll you'll pull through. You just got to keep pushing. That's the that's the level that you want to be at. It's super hard. I mean, uh, if if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. Everybody would be um, ultra successful at the things that they're after. But the the real trick of it is not in the artwork or whatever it is that you're trying to do it's not that itself it's this right here what we're talking about learning to um le learning to push through that pain you know what i'm saying recognizing that that the fact that you recognizing the fact that you recognize that your work isn't where you want it is proof that you're on the right track that's so important Avid's built a decent portfolio to send off to clients. Any advice on sending portfolios out or reaching out to art directors to show them your work? Um, yeah, Frios, my, my pleasure. A anytime you guys have questions, please uh, pipe in because it, these, are, these are things that everybody's wondering. Um, let's see. Advice on sending them out. The, uh, your portfolio is definitely a major contributing part to your getting work. But I'd say one of the things that's going to matter just as much, if not more, is the, the relationships that you develop in the industry and amongst people at your level. Um, what you want to do is reach out, instead of reaching out just to directors, reach out to other artists at the same level you are and try and work on building a community together. Because the people that are around you that are they're struggling on the same path at the same level you are. Uh, that community that you built, that you build is a community of support through the same kind of struggles. And you will ultimately end up introducing each other to the jobs and the opportunities and the prospects. So as much, of course, you want to send your stuff out to, to uh, art directors. You want to send your stuff out to companies. You want to apply. Um, but you want to make sure that, that you're not doing it just cold. 
So that's why I think a lot of these events and things like that can be so powerful and useful for your career and your development in the greater community that you are contributing to. It is important to view it that way, that you're part of this bigger thing. How can you help others? And in the long run, it will always help you as well, because the community is going to be the thing that makes uh, that progress possible. Um, I'm trying to give you answers that are not canned, that are not what everybody else will tell you. Uh, another thing that I think I've, I've, another bit of advice I've given for students and people trying to get work is look, it's super important before you even really get to the stage of showing your work to really self assess and to really look at where you are. And the thing I recommend is look at the work of the people that are doing the job you already want, because if you get that job, they're not, they're not your, they're not your bosses. They're your peers. So are, is your work on par with your peers? You need to start looking at, at the professionals that you would like to be working with or are doing the thing you would like to be doing as your peers and examining where you fit in that hierarchy. This is something that happens all the time with people that are just starting to try and send their portfolios out is they fixate on their experience in school or in that smaller setting. Like maybe they were the maybe they were the big fish in this particular pond. But when you get out into the into the greater world, if you haven't been comparing your work, if you're only comparing your work to your peers at where you are and not your peers at where you want to be, uh, you're going to be in for a really rough surprise. And uh, that's one of those things that I've, you know, I've had students and, and I've had uh, people studying under me look up the work of the, the people that they plan to work with. And they're like, I'm ready. I want to show my portfolio. I want to get this job. OK, let's look up some of this work from where you want to be. And that's when the tears come. Sucks, but it's super important. I mean, this it's like we were just talking about understanding your tastes and your tastes compared to the level that you're at. So that's that's a piece of advice that I would definitely hit hard on is is really be comfortable with self-examining and look learn how to look at your portfolio with a critical eye. Uh, you want to be doing external freelance with Hearthstone. You've made four sample images to send them, but no idea how to word the email. Ah, so was were the samples asked for? Were they t uh, basically a test done for the art directors so that you could get employment there? Or are you doing this cold call style? That's a, a very important aspect to this question. Self-test, cold call. Okay. Um, the way to handle that, and I've done this myself, is make in, instead of um, instead of making like specifically Hearthstone card images. Certainly, try to get to that style, but it there's almost a level of presumptuousness if you're just trying to like redesign or something like that. Certainly, do that for your personal practice. But I wouldn't send those directly. I would try and do work that is uh, really indicative of your style and what you intend to do and, and focus on your own voice and put together pieces. And then what you would want to do is have a few pieces ready. Make sure that they're small, not really huge, or, or put them all into one single image with your, you know, your email. Basically like a flyer. If you were to make a flyer with your artwork, there's two or three pieces in it small not huge email that and say hey i'm a freelancer artist i'm looking i'm uh, current i'm currently available which is excuse me it's a very subtle way of basically saying that you are a professional that is already working um you don't want to come off like you're sounding like this is your first gig this is your first rodeo you're completely you know uh green behind the ears or whatever the phrase is i'm totally spacing on it right now wet behind the ears um you want to you want to imply that you're a professional that has time right now for their project you don't want to be a dick but you do want to you do want to have an air of professionality that's very important um 
hey, I've got, I've, I've, uh, I've got some time. Um, I'm, I'm looking for work in, in this specific field. I really enjoy your product, Hearthstone. I've been playing so and so. The artwork has just been popping out to me. Uh, please, please uh, take a look at my portfolio, link included, uh, and, and let me know if I can help you out on your next project. Real simple, nothing, nothing too heavy. And then the next step is how you follow up. So in all likelihood, they're not going to respond to you at all because they're an art director and you're some fucking rando. You're just a rando and they are busy, busy, busy. It's important when you're doing this kind of stuff to remember the perspective of the people whom you're trying to get help from. You have to think about it from where they're coming from so that you, by, by keeping in mind and always at the forefront of your mind that, that they're a person that's busy, they have responsibilities, they're handling all these other things. It helps you, it helps prevent you from taking lack of response or even rejection and making it all about you and screwing you and you suck and you're the worst. No, these people are in a position, they have a job, they're doing a thing. Um, that you, you may be able to build a working relationship with them, but don't internalize the things that happen. I Usually ghosting is the worst feeling thing, I think. I'd much rather get a response that says, hey, thanks for sending it, I really like this, I like that. And this is what I tried to do with, with people that were trying to get hired under me. I like what you got. Th these are things that need a little bit of work. Um, send me something when a after you've you've had some time with it. And those those that's much better feedback than just totally ghosting, but it, ghosting happens. And understand that it happens usually because the person doesn't have time. Um, so this is what you do. You've sent your lovely email. You've got your little flyer in there. I call it, a, I used to call it a mail out. So my mail out would be in there. It would have a bunch of images in it and it would have my contact info. I'd have that little brief message. Hey, I love what you guys are doing. I feel like I could contribute. Uh, I've got some free time. Okay, maybe, two weeks later to a month later, have either other artwork already in the hopper or work on something. And especially if they gave you notes, absolutely do something that, that tackles those specific notes. Um, this is super important. If they give you notes, do the work, put in the time, especially if you're like really starting out, put in the time. And what this shows is that you can take constructive criticism and work with it like an employee would because nothing you ever do when you're doing an illustration it's very rare that you're going to do something they're like brilliant brilliant we're doing it no notes print it ship it you're done that's super rare so if you show that you can take feedback and work on that and and improve with it you're showing that you have professional quality um but yeah so later on two weeks, a month, um, hit them back up and say, hey, I just did this piece. Uh, I thought it was kind of relevant. Check it out. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Don't be pushy. Just light and airy, breezy, just stopping in. Hey, how's it going? Be very light and breezy. If there's no response after that second one, let it go. But you already did the work. You can now use this work for someplace else. Um, the other thing that I want to advise for that is don't fixate on that dream job. The vast majority of people that end up doing really, really fun, awesome art jobs end up in places that they didn't actually intend to go for. Like 99.99% of my students and people that have worked, uh, studied under me were like, oh, I, you know, Pixar or, uh, um, Sony, I want to work on uh, on the next Last of Us. Like this, this is where a lot of the mindset goes. Is like, I need to do this thing, and this is the mark of success. You gotta alter that right now. Nip that in the butt because there are so many art jobs out there that use the the specialties and the the skill set that you are building right now, and by by narrowing it out and cutting out all these other opportunities you are totally screwing yourself because there's a limited amount of people there's a limited amount of space that that pixar just can't take all the people that would be interested in let alone i mean that 
let alone all the people that are interested in, they couldn't even fit all the people that are actually capable of working there. You see what I'm saying? Look at other opportunities. Look at look for other art jobs. Look for other card game. There's tons of card game jobs out there. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you wouldn't even think to look at. Look at uh, the art that's done for like casino games and things like that, or doing design for theme parks. Or, I mean, even um, I know some people have got some really great gigs doing posters for markets like there's work everywhere and if you find a way to make it challenging for yourself you can make any art job a great art job but that's on you um easier said than done i know because all of us on some level are kind of gross squirmy little glory hounds i get it i'm the same way and i did do that i went full glory i need the glory i need to do this thing i need to work here i need to do that but then uh, you know as i've yeah, <laughs> uh ripened on the vine if you will uh i've learned that it's really like it's really about doing what you care about doing you know what i'm saying and making sure that you have a job that allows you to use this skill set and to continue honing this skill set and you never know maybe someday that pixar job might come down the line or this hearthstone job um set your sights there but don't make it the only thing you set your sights on and that if you don't get that then you are a failure at this that's an extremely dangerous mindset and it will prevent you from uh from growing and from finding the work that might get you where you want to go in the long run it's a it's a long journey so take your time you'll be safe make a mail out nice message say you love their product yeah, I mean, you don't need to be you don't need to be gross about it. <laughs> but uh, if you do enjoy their product, let them know, you know, don't make it up. Don't be fake. Never be fake. Um, that stuff comes right through. You can read it immediately. Hey, stop doing that. Never be fake with a potential client because they'll know um, you want to if you if you really genuinely enjoy enjoy something, let them know. Perfect example. Right. So I had applied after Sony. I'd applied for some work at uh, Riot, and I told him like, hey, uh, you know, the art looks cool, but I have never played your guys' game, sorry to say. I mean, of course they forced me to play it, but <laughs> yeah, it just wasn't, it wasn't my kind of game, and it wasn't really what I was after, but the artwork would, was going to be fun, so try and approach it that way. Be honest, always. Honest, honesty, always. You just feel like you need some kind of validation by a bigger company to be able to show other clients and build a resume. Oh man, I feel you. Right in the heart, that one. Um, you're never gonna get the validation that you need in order to do the thing that you're gonna do. And I have proof positive right here. We're doing it right now. Uh, I am doing a thing because I want I want to make my own IPs out there and because no one has picked up my IPs then I got frustrated and started to feel like okay maybe my stories are garbage or maybe what I'm doing is garbage and that mindset's gonna just the, the need for validation in order to make that final thing is also potentially poison so be careful about the need for validation from a studio that you think would be respect worthy this is still glory hounding in a way and i again i get it i totally do but it's it's dangerous to make that your primary goal if that makes sense you want you really want to make it about that about the process of learning and you want to get to the point where the where you are having so much fun doing what you do and you're enjoying doing what you do so much that the validation of a studio shouldn't matter. And that's I mean, hey, you know, I'm I'm preaching, but this is also something that I'm I still struggle with. So, I don't expect you to figure this out immediately, and you shouldn't expect yourself either. But this is I mean, it's a struggle that we all have. You didn't know I applied for Riot? Yeah, I did. Well, what had happened was, is after I left Sony, I basically said, hey, I'm freelance. And then uh, some friends that were there were like, hey, we actually need some stuff. Let, let us know if you'd be interested. So, yeah, I applied. I went in, did an interview and everything. I talked with the art directors for the project. And it, I mean, it was it was a really interesting experience. That was before Riot was at their current studio, which is massive. 
It's like a, it's an actual campus, and they've got you know di multiple diners and and squash courts and things like that. It's like it's wow, yeah, it's over the top. It's a massive place, um, but yeah, they they're a cool company, and the artists are great, top, top tier, no question. Like I I always felt a little out of place there. Like everybody's so damn good, but that, I mean that's how this works. You just just kind of go with it and, and try and have fun. Anyway, so we've been doing some sketching. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and uh, kill this sketch here. Um, basically, yeah, this is, this is kind of what I'm going to be doing for the days that we don't have something specific planned, like a crit session or something like that. We're going to be working on Bloodflower. Um, if you dig that, awesome. Uh, subscribe, follow, all that good stuff. I'm gonna try and keep, uh, as we go, I'm gonna continue writing the story on the back end and I'll show you guys where, where, where it's progressing each day. And then of course, I would like to make it somewhat interactive. So I think with each sort of uh, story beat that has multiple illustrations, we can like do polls or, or do like, see, see, what, see what you guys wanna see painted first, see what you wanna see explored first. And, and we're gonna learn all of this together because I've never really done a book like this. So it's gonna be really fun. And uh, hopefully you'll be down for joining on the ride. Any last minute questions or stuff like that? It's been a good long session, so I think we've covered some good ground. <laughs> we will absolutely have some opportunities. I've got some, I've got some fun little things planned for your guys' Z-bolts or Z bolts, which are, if you've been looking at your chat down at the bottom, you should have little sort of a viewers, uh, a currency that, that you, you slowly build up via just, just hanging out and watching. And I wanted to make, put together some very specific rewards so that, uh, you know, you, you can spend your Z bolts and do something like maybe have an art direction. You get to be an art director for a minute things like that. So I, I'm exploring the different op uh, options. Just keep hanging out and watching and building up your Z-bolts because heaven knows what you're going to want to spend it on in the near future. I think that'll be a fun little uh, fun little game to play together. So I can also show you what it's like to have an art director totally throw a wrench in, your, in where you're going with something. So I wanted you guys to kind of experience this whole thing. Portfolio review option, that might be a thing to do. Yeah. Definitely. What you can do if, if you're all interested in, in, uh, in, and you have some specific ideas, absolutely let me know what you think. Um, you can, uh, let's see, you could follow on, on uh, YouTube and comment on YouTube. I think you can leave comments and message me and I think they're whispers here on stream. Send me messages, let me know what you think. If you have any specific rewards that you think would be really cool or fun for us to do together, uh, feel free to let me know, okay? Because I, I definitely want this to be as interactive as possible, so you guys aren't just sitting and, and watching me draw, you know, pregnant ladies smashing through people's spines every day. <laughs> Actually, that sounds kind of awesome. <laughs> anyway, uh, so hope you all enjoyed hanging out. Thanks for watching the stream. Until next time, paint smart, paint sexy. I'm Izzy, a professional writer, concept artist, and illustrator. I've taught painting for a dozen years or so on and offline. Many of your favorite illustrators and designers have studied with me or under me and have gone on to teach in their own right. You're here because like they did, you wanna to learn to paint realistically for illustration or concept art. Well, worry not, you're in the right place. Grab a seat. I want you to join me as I explain all the aspects of image making in extremely digestible and clear monthly lessons. Not through the lens of silly how to paint hair or eye demos. That shit is carnival tricks. And you're not really learning anything except an exact way to render one thing in one manner. This is painting mysticism at its worst. Watching these kinds of exploitative lessons won't help you level up with your understanding. Sure, now you can paint sparkly hair, but what if you want to paint a dragon, or figure out how to render a sea of fire, or depict a one-eyed transgender space marine dying in the vacuum of space? Painting and image making are tools of communication, and can be learned by anyone willing to put in some time. 
Like grammar is for language, light, color, and form literally follow a formula. Painting well is not a matter of chicken bones, zombie crackers, and the ever-dismissive concept of talent. Learning with my series, Izzy's Logic of Light and Color, will give you the tools and understanding so you can analyze light and form in reality and bring it to life in your work. Using this simple system I have distilled will help you harness your art to share your ideas as you've always intended. When we are children, we all draw in symbols. Symbols for our house, our hands, the sun, the grass, our pet lobster. As we grow into artists, we must learn to throw away symbols and begin to draw and paint what it is we actually see. And as we grow further, we learn to paint beyond what we see and what is actually there. Until finally we move beyond this and learn to trim away what is actually there so we voice only what we want. With me, you're going to have to buckle in and maybe take some pain meds. Because I'm going to rip out your normal person's eyes and replace them with a painter's eyes. I'm going to restructure how you see and how you understand what you're seeing. I'm going to turn you into a painting machine. Truly, anyone can learn to paint realistically if they can both determine what they're seeing or imagining with basic and straightforward rules. Once you understand the mechanics of light, color, and form, in reality, you will have the capacity to paint anything you can see or imagine realistically. After that, the real fun begins. Here are some of the ways you can join me and master the logic of light and color. The very first lesson of my series is totally free on my YouTube channel. In that lesson, I give you the three primary rules of light that are the very foundation of painting and understanding light itself. If you do nothing else to make your painting mastery easier, at least watch this amazing little lesson. It will do more for your basic understanding of light than just about any tutorial you can find. When you're ready to get deeper and you feel like you have those first rules figured out, allow me to utterly blow your mind with the next episodes available on Gumroad and ArtStation. As we go deeper into the rules underlying the logic of light and color, I carefully and simply explain important and interesting elements. From beginner to pro, there is an amazing amount of information available. Each concept has been distilled into the clearest explanation you're likely to find anywhere. Like episode two, where we cover the atmospheric effect and how that relates to light, scale, and distance of objects in reality, and how to render it. Or episode three, where I hand over the ultimate key to controlling value in your paintings. Episodes five through eight are all about rendering materials. Want to understand the logic behind rendering metal, leather, hair, transparency, damn near anything. I even cover the logic behind painting special effects like fire, neon, or lightsabers in later episodes. The lessons just get deeper and more detailed as I build on the foundations covered in preceding episodes. The tenth gives you the most important rule of composition you'll ever learn to keep your images interesting. The next few episodes cover important painting techniques like my edge control ninjutsu or simplification with the large to small system. We dip a toe in color theory, devote a few episodes to finishing full-blown illustrations utilizing the techniques we've learned so far. Some episodes, like the lighting game or advanced exercises one, the shirt, present cheap, valuable and practical exercises to give you explosive growth in your development. Episodes 22 through 25 cover painting and illustration just like I do for Magic the Gathering. From assignment and inception to signing the painting at the end, each one is full of tips, knowledge, everything to make working as an illustrator easier. Did you enjoy learning how to paint basic materials? Metal, wood and such? I got three whole episodes devoted to the intricate logic behind painting different kinds of skin. After that, more lessons devoted to pumping life into your portraits and original methods for accurately drawing faces out of your head. From fundamentals to photo bashing, Gumroad and ArtStation have every lesson I create available for purchase a la carte. But here's an even better way to learn with me. Stay current with my latest lessons on Patreon for the lowest price available. Monthly support gets my student that month's lesson, a critique or paint over of their finished work, a discount code for 25% off the entire Gumroad archive, 
and access to the Logic of Light and Color Discord community, where we plan future lessons, share knowledge, and learn together as a team. The absolute best method is to join my Patreon classroom at the Student Plus tier, where you'll get everything I just mentioned and a free episode from the archive every month to accelerate your mastery at your own pace. You've decided to take control of your painting and master Izzy's logic of light and color. Now it's up to you to choose the path that's best for you. I'll see you on the flip side. Paint smart, paint sexy.